Hello and welcome to another edition of Lab Rats. My name is Andy Walker. I'm Sean Carruthers. And this is a show where we demystify technology, explain how all those crazy widget thingies work in your uh, computer and your uh, mobile phone and uh, all the other gadgets you're going to receive uh, for, for you know, your birthday and crap like that. So, <laughs> uh, But today, of course, uh, we answer your questions, uh, as we like to do occasionally. We uh, dip our hand into the mailbag over at uh, butterscotch.com slash ask, or as, as Paul likes to call it, our producer, ask bag. Yay! Uh, so uh, today we have a whole new batch of questions, Sean. We do have another batch of questions submitted by you, the viewer. Very good. All right. Well, that's it for today. So uh, I don't know, this is like episode number 27 of, how many ask bags have we done so I far? I don't even know. Half a dozen or so, or a dozen, I don't know. Anyway, you like them. You tell us you like them, so we keep doing them. So uh, we'll get started. That's after this. Yay. Welcome back to Lab Rats. So before we get started, a quick message from our sponsor, uh, which is VeriSign. Now, VeriSign, of course, is the company that is uh, trusted to, and to safeguard the .com and .net uh, domains out there on the internet. They are um, the company that really uh, is responsible for a lot of that that plumbing in behind the internet. And you know, they've been doing this for more than a decade. So if you want to learn about more how they do that. Um, you know, how they uh, do that and what it takes to run .com and .net. Zip on over to verisignincom slash connect uh, to find out more about how they create the internet magic that they do. Yay. Yay is right. A lot of magic. So thank, thanks, Verisign. Again, verisignincom slash connect. All right, let's get started. So uh, let's go straight to the mailbox, I guess. Okay. Are you ready to go? Sure. Okay, good. All well, your senses are sharpened. Okay, good. All right, so uh, first question this week is, uh, now this came, of course, from butterscotch.com slash ask. Somebody posted this question there uh, where we answer your questions, and so do other people. Uh, can a computer function properly with two operating systems, Sean? Yes, it can. So, so let's talk a little bit about that. All right, so there's and a... why would you want to? Why would you want to? Okay, there's, there's a couple good reasons for, for this. So a lot of people like to dual boot. And one of the reasons they want to do this is they want to use more than one different operating system. Say they want to use Windows, but they also want to try out Linux. But they want to do it all on the same machine. They don't want to have to wipe their Windows machine just to be able to run Linux or run two different machines. Mm -hmm. So you can actually run two different operating systems on the same machine. Now, the, the thing is it can't have the uh, files in exactly the same place. So for example, you can run a version of Windows XP and a version of Windows Vista, if you wanted to, or Windows 7, on the same machine, but it can't have the operating system files in exactly the same directory. It won't work that way. So what uh, Microsoft has set up uh, in Windows, for example, is a little file called boot.ini, which is an initialization file that allows your computer to understand where all the operating system files are. Mm -hmm. So when you set up something like Linux on this, generally it gives you the option of putting it in a different place on the hard drive and dual booting your machine so that uh, the operating or the Linux uh, installer will then go into boot.ini on your Windows machine, adjust it, and say, "Okay, now you have the choice when you're booting up of going into this one or this one." And we've actually got uh, a sample boot.ini file right here. This is what it would look like. It's a bunch of gibberish to most people, yeah. but it basically tells the machine where the operating system files are on what disk, so it doesn't have to be on the same hard disk. If you've got a machine with multiple hard drives inside, you can put one drive or one operating system on one, one on the other. So you could have two yeah. physical hard drives, Yeah. right? And then this, this basically says it's on the D drive or it's on the C drive, boot from yeah. there or boot from here. Exactly. Um, or you could have one physical drive that's partitioned, I suppose, Yes. and you could use that to point to a different partition. Yeah, that's the way to do it when you're doing with Linux. So it'll carve out a section of the drive, another partition on the, the same drive. So it's a virtual disk rather than a physical disk. Mm -hmm and say, OK, you want Linux? Point there. If you want Windows, point there. And then it'll boot from those particular boot files over okay. there. Right. So that's, that's one way to do that. And uh, generally, when you're, doing, um, when you're doing a Linux install, it'll give you that option to set it up like that. You can set it up manually yourself. If you go into your Windows system and find a boot INI file and edit it, you can actually tap in the, the location where you want to do it. So if you want to install it on a different drive, like Windows 7 on a different drive, you can actually manually adjust that. It's a little bit of hard uh, legwork there, but there is a way to do it. And we'll uh, put this uh, support article from Microsoft that shows you the, the way to do that. On now, the show notes? On the show notes, yeah. So uh, another way to do that is uh, through virtualization. Now, this is something we've been doing on the Mac. Now, one of the things, if you have a, a Windows-based notebook, you can't put Macintosh on it, not legally anyways. You can do it with a little bit of hackery and a little bit of uh, 
non-sanctioned uh, things. But um, you can do it the other way around. You can put Windows or Linux or other things on the Macintosh. Yeah. First of all, using something called Boot Camp. That's a, a utility that is built into Macintosh these mm -hmm. days that allows you to, again, carve a partition out of your drive or set it up on another drive and say, okay, we're going to that one instead. But you can also use virtualization on either Windows or Macintosh. And in this case, we're using something called Parallels. And what we have is Windows right here running in a virtual machine. So everything is in one big lump on the machine. It's uh, opening that up inside software rather than pointing to another place on the hardware and running it all right here. Right. So, so Parallels, VMware, I think does that too, right? Yeah, VMware is another one. They have uh, versions. And again, they don't just run on Mac. They run on Windows machines as well. In fact, I think uh, on the Windows side, you have something called the VMware player that will do this for free. You can spend money on one of these other uh, op options like uh, Parallels. That gives you a little bit more functionality. But there are ways just to run a machine without spending too much money on it. And well. I think some of these guys, you can actually run multiple operating systems. You could do like a half a dozen or a dozen. I mean. Yeah, the, right. the big thing, of course, is whenever you add a virtual machine onto your drive here is it takes up a big chunk of space. So if your Windows install is going to take like 10 to 15 gigabytes, well, that's a 10 or 15 gigabyte file sitting here on your machine. Right. But you can run multiple ones. In fact, Parallels, I have a list of two right now, but I've had that up to five or six, and it can go even further than that. You just have to have the hard drive space available for it to point to those files and open them up as virtual machines. I got it. OK, great. Good answer. So uh -huh. if you want to find out more, you can zip on over to butterscotch.com to the, 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 this episode, uh, and we'll have a bunch of show notes for you to find out more. Yeah, and we've done episodes before on parallels and, and virtualization as well. So yes. good. All right. So question for you, sir. Mm -hmm. Will unmounting an SD card erase everything on it? Aha! Unmounting an SD card, right? So unmounting being um, it's the idea of you know when you when you're placing a card into a computer, as Sean has a little reader here, what happens is the, the system will actually mount it, will actually create it such that it can read and write to it. Um, but that process is actually uh, kind of dangerous because if you decide to rip that card out from the, 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 uh, well, uh, from the drive while it's mounted and it's in the middle of a write session, you could corrupt the data. And in fact, on the, in, the, in the Mac world, there is an issue here where uh, you really want to eject or unmount. This is this the Mac word for you know unmount the card or any or and, and this includes um, USB keys as well that have uh, flash memory in them as well. So uh, one way to do it is to is to select the drive on your desktop and hit uh, Command E to eject. Um, in the Windows world, you can right click on it too and say eject, or there's a usually little icon in the system tray down the right hand side of it um, to eject it as well. Uh, Windows is a little bit smarter about it, but if you you know if you're you're responsible and rip that thing out when it's writing, you can actually corrupt the content on it. Yeah, and then ruin the card for that matter. Yeah, and we've got here on the on the Macintosh where you see it even on the Finder sidebar, it's got the name of it uh, right here in the in your devices tab, and it's got a little eject button beside that. So right now we can rip it out. Uh, you'll see when we rip it out like that, it's actually going to give us a warning saying, please don't do that. Yeah. Say the disk was not ejected properly. So theoretically, if there was anything on here that I wanted to keep, I'd be biting my nails right now, wondering if it was still there yeah. on the Macintosh. Right. Otherwise, just hit the eject button. Yeah. There you go. Okay, good. All right. Next question. So this person is looking for a video editor that allows him or her to rotate a, a video. So that was, you know, one shot like this, <laughs> right? And oh, I know this. They're like, oh, look, let me turn the camera that way. But of course, then it all plays sideways. sideways. So uh, they're looking for something that has either low price or freeware, if, if possible. So. Um, do you have something along those lines we've, that would help this person? We've got a couple of things that we can uh, we can do here to uh, to help out. So uh, we've got uh, first of all a free file that we found on uh, Two Cows, which is our sister site, and they have a bunch of downloads. It's called it's called Free Video Flip and Rotate. And uh, it's it's free. You can download it and try it out to see if it works. It's, it's good for Windows machines. Uh, from Windows 2000 all the way up to Vista, and I'm assuming that'll work on Windows 7 as well. So again, just rotate or flip the video with one easy mouse click, it says. Very so cool. So give it a try. I haven't actually tried that one out myself, but it's, uh, it's sitting there and ready for you to try. Um, now, so we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Put a link well, to that in the show notes. As well as on the screen here. One that I have tried and uh, do recommend is uh, uh, QuickTime. QuickTime Pro. Oh, yeah. so, uh, QuickTime Pro? QuickTime Pro. Yeah. So there's two versions, right? There's QuickTime, which is the freebie right. from Apple, and the QuickTime Pro, which is what is a $30, 40 bucks, something like that? It's $30. $30 so yeah. now, if you have Macintosh, uh, the newest versions of it, you probably already have QuickTime X, 
Yeah. Um, I'm not sure whether that's QuickTime 10 or not, or just QuickTime X. Um, but it does have that uh, built in already. So if you have that uh, uh, a video open in, on your Mac in QuickTime X, you can go up to the, the file menu and flip it from there. So you can edit it right there and flip it. Good. Um, now, it not, uh, that's not available for Windows uh, at this point. So QuickTime 7, which was the previous version, which is why I'm wondering whether it's X or 10, um, and that one's still available for download, and you can get a pro version of it as well. So you can see uh, right now I've got a file up here. We're going to look at this uh, half size so we can fit it onto the screen. So I've got a video here that's um, it's already in the right direction, but you can go up uh, into the uh, movie properties here, mm -hmm. click on the video track, and now you see uh, over here on the, the pro version of it, you have the aversion to flip it. You can basically flip it um, and mirror the image. You can uh, flip it the other way if you want, or you can just start spinning it sideways. So it, it's really quick and easy if, uh, if you have it uh, shot on, on the angle like you have uh, when you're shooting with a camera in the wrong orientation. It's just a quick uh, one click to turn it in the right direction. Pretty cool. Um, again, this is available for both Mac and Windows. Um, and it also has other ability, like ability to transcode uh, into different formats. It has the ability to trim in and out points and a number of other things that are in here. Right. So it, uh, it does have, a, oh, even basic editing. So you can take uh, small sections of it, copy and paste them within the QuickTime window and actually create a little uh, mashup uh, right within QuickTime. And again, Neat. it's only 30 bucks, very powerful for only 30 bucks. Okay. And you can do all of this in, in something that's more expensive, like uh, Premiere Elements or something like that, but that, you're looking at 100 bucks when you go that way. So good stuff. All right, next. All right, this is for you. Oh, you can read it if you like. Uh, my Bluetooth does not turn on when I press the power button. So do I have to download something? That's no. The question. No, not generally. Yeah, Bluetooth is a bit of a mystery for many people, especially people who you know are fairly new to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the trick with Bluetooth is you have to pair. So you have uh, your phone, for example, and you have a headset here. So We've got, uh, we've got our headset here, and uh, right now it's turned off. So the uh, person is asking why when they turn it on, it doesn't actually connect. Connect to anything. Okay, so here's, here's one reason. So to turn it on, you'll press a button generally to turn it on, and uh, you've got to hold it long enough until it fires up. And press the button firmly enough. Okay, so now we've got this thing. It's turned on, right? We've got a white button, or a white light flashing here. Yeah. It's not going to connect to anything. No. Now, all it is right now is it's on. It's on. So what we need to do here, and, and this will vary from uh, Bluetooth headset to Bluetooth headset, is we need to turn it back off yep. or find the proper sequence to do this, yep. obviously. In this case, we'll just press again from off state and keep holding. So uh, ideally, what you're doing here is you're, you're pushing the button, putting it into pairing mode, which is special mode. It'll go and search to see if yeah. there's anything out there that it can connect with. Right. And then you want to put the other end of it, so whatever it is connecting to, if it's a cell phone, you want to put that into pairing mode as well. So they can find each other, right? Now what you'll need to do here, of course, is sometimes you'll need to type in a code to authenticate that. Right. Um, and that'll be available in the manual of whatever device you have the capability of typing into. So if it's a cell phone, you know, you'll have that capability there. Uh, often it's one, two, three, four, well, one, two, three, four, five. You know, often zero 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 zero, zero, zero as well. Zero, so yeah, as well. it'll, it'll uh, vary by that. And if you're if you're connecting something that is say your handset to uh, like your touchpad or whatever, often you can set the the number that you're going to choose on both ends. So you choose it, the number on one end and then enter it in on the other as right. well. So yeah. there you go. That's how you do it. So that that's uh, one way to do it. Now uh, the other thing is uh, is often if, if you've already got this device paired to something else then you won't be able to connect it to another device because it's already paired. So it's yeah. saying, I'm not communicating with anybody else right now. So that could be the problem, too. If you've already got a device that's already connected to something else, you can't pair it to something else. Unpair it first. And Unpair then it, then repair it. Exactly. OK, good. All right. Thanks. All right. So my friend recorded a video of us on his iPhone the other night. He sent me the video from his iPhone to my Yahoo email address. I received it, but can't watch the video on my computer. I have a Windows XP machine, and I want to watch it. Aha. Yeah, Windows XP. You have an issue here uh, where there's a problem with the, there's a missing codec. So a codec is actually a piece of software that allows you to uh, interpret the video file and actually play it back through a machine's, um, a machine's uh, hardware. 
Um, and it's, so what you want to do is, in this particular case, you're talking about looking at, what's this, is an MPEG-4, was it, or something like that? Yeah, it's off of uh, the, the iPhone, so it's a, a QuickTime file of quick some time sort. File. So what you really need to do is basically install QuickTime, which is a QuickTime player, which is free from, uh, from Apple, from actually QuickTime.com or Apple.com slash QuickTime. Mm -hmm. Install that, it'll install the appropriate codec so that you can play that back on Windows XP. Um, many uh, of the more modern versions of Windows have some uh, codecs pre-built in. Uh, they tend not to have the Apple ones. You'll have to go and install QuickTime. Mm -hmm. You'll find that pretty much with, you know, lots, a lot of AVI files won't play natively on Windows either, and you'll need a special uh, uh, codec for that as well, and you have to go out and look for the appropriate codec to play those guys. Yeah. And one other thing you can do as well, instead of uh, necessarily going and uh, loading QuickTime, is, is get uh, something called VLC, which is a player that actually has a lot of these other codecs, including QuickTime, and the ability to play them. So you just download VLC from videoland.org, and it'll uh, give you the ability to play a lot of different files that Windows can't play natively. So, right. And that's a free download. Good stuff. All right, great. So let's uh, wrap this up with another break, and then when we come back, we'll take maybe one more question. And uh, we've got a clip of the week in your pictures as well. So that's after this. Welcome back to Lab Rats. So uh, we have one more question. Uh, so when you pull it, and then we'll uh, get on to Clip of the Week after that. All right. This is a very simple one for you, mister. Yeah. It's a, how do I set the time on an Android phone? Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. You know the answer to this one, I hear. I, I do. Well, I have a new Nexus S phone here. Um, so I can kind of show you. Now, this is going to vary from phone to phone. But essentially, what you want to do is you want to find the settings. Um, what was that again? Find the what? The settings. I always, I always love the way you say settings. Why? It's a little bit odd. Settings? What do you say? Settings? Settings? Settings. 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 You say settings. Do I? Yes. Uh, just, just something I've noticed after working with you for 287 episodes. Yes, I got it. <laughs> I got it. Good. So you wanted to go through this, and you want to look for date and time, which is down here in this particular case. Now, as you can see, I've got it set for automatic, so the check mark. So that'll actually go yeah. out to the network. Uh, to the actual carrier, like the cell carrier, and actually adjust itself for from there. So I'm going to turn off automatic, and now I can actually set the time manually and uh, change it to whatever I want. Now, so why would you want to do that? Well, a couple of reasons why you want to do that. One, if, when you're roaming uh, to a foreign country, for example, it doesn't always uh, pick up the date and time either right away or ever. Actually, I've found, it, especially you know, if you're uh, roaming on a, on a foreign network, even if you're roaming on a foreign network. Mm -hmm. So when you're in the same country, but you're going on another network because they have a deal of some sort, that uh, sometimes just won't set. Second of all, sometimes, and I won't name names, there are some companies that, uh, for example, don't observe daylight savings right away, and they don't change their networks immediately. So that can be a bit of a pain in the butt. Um, what company that starts with R would you be talking about I there? don't know what company that starts with R. I have no idea. But uh, we won't mention them. And. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think. There would be a couple other things that you that you would uh, worry about the time and date for. Um, you, in fact, you want to stay on automatic as much as possible if you mm -hmm. can, because if you start messing with the time and date, you can actually mess with the timestamp on your email, mm -hmm. which can make your uh, inbox go a bit crazy. You can yeah. go and grab out new emails, uh, you know, um, and bring in duplicates. That can be actually, a pain. One thing that I heard that uh, our friend Paul does yes. is he actually sets his five minutes ahead so he isn't late for things. Uh. Ah, okay. right. And does that work, Paul? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, so I'm always on time. It's always Very on time. Lovely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I suppose you it's, do It's that, a nice right? theory. It's a nice theory. So you could actually manually set it five minutes ahead so that you're technically, until you remember that you've set it five minutes ahead, then you go, well, i got an extra five minutes, and then you're late again. But anyway. But it's, you know, it's an option. Anyway, so that's how to do it. Uh, again, it varies you know, version to version, uh, um, Android version to Android version. So, but uh, more or less, that's how you do it. And turn automatic off and adjust it yourself, or turn automatic on. And See what happens. Here. This particular person obviously is having a problem. Now, that what's interesting is on uh, the ask uh, service on butterscotch.com, we got a lot of international people asking questions, people from around the world. So I can completely imagine that uh, if somebody is having trouble here, maybe in a country that has either a low cost provider who's not doing that properly, or, you know, or it hasn't, automatic hasn't been turned on. So if you're having an issue, you might want to turn automatic on to go and fetch it from the network as well. There you go. There you go. Now, speaking of Android, uh, we have a great uh, weekly show that uh, brings you the latest and greatest in Android news and features and that sort of thing. Uh, it's produced by or hosted by uh, Andrew Moore Crispin, one of our uh, editorial guys here. Uh, in fact, he's our new editor-in-chief. And uh, you want to zip on over 
to check that out at Android, it's a show called Android Weekly, so you can go to androidweekly.tv to see it, or of course, butterscotch.com slash androidweekly. But let's take a look at it for 30 seconds right here. Welcome on deck, I'm Matt Harris. Hi, I'm Jay Goldman. Welcome to the A-List. Hi, welcome to Miss Download. Now, with the TouchDroid and Cyanogen mod projects in full swing, it seems a touchpad running Android may not be too far off. We saw a video recently of Cyanogen mod running, albeit slowly, on the touchpad. A final build that's ready for the rest of us to try out is a ways off, but it's heartening to see. If you missed out on the touchpad fire sale the first time around, fear not. It seems that HP will be doing one more run of touchpad devices, between 500,000 and 1 million to hit shelves before Halloween. HP says to meet demand. Analysts say to meet agreements already in place with component suppliers. Whatever the case, we'll be lining up early. We missed out on the last blowout. This time we will have satisfaction. No one shall stand in our way. Again, if you want to catch Android Weekly every week, you zip on over to butterscotch.com uh, at the URL on your screen and uh, check it out. Uh, subscribe. Uh, watch it one episode at a time. Um, it's also available on iTunes and a bunch of other places. So. But that would be the resource to go and check it out and uh, see it on a regular basis. A very good idea. Very good idea. All right, so now it's my favorite time of the show, and it's called Picture Time. Picture Time. Ba, 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 ba. How many pictures do we have this week? We have only one. Only one. Only okay. One. Do we need more? We need more. We need more. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Uh, we uh, have uh, this one from our uh, good friend uh, Tarek in uh, Austin, Texas, uh -huh. and this is his cat Pythagoras. Pythagoras the and, cat. And the story about this is uh, recently uh, there was a snow in Austin, Texas, which doesn't happen a lot. But uh, Pythagoras was actually born in Australia, which is Tarek, where Tarek is originally from. And he moved to Texas with this poor cat who had never experienced snow before in the place they were living in in Australia. So right. I wouldn't have thought that moving uh, to Texas would have been the best place to experience a snowfall necessarily. but. Well, who's to say? Anyways, it was a winter wonderland for uh, Pythagoras. Pythagoras's snowy adventures. Yes. Very good. Well, thank so, you, yeah. uh, Tarek. That's awesome. Yeah, and uh, that was uh, that's the last photograph in our queue right now. Okay. So we need photographs. We need you, 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 you <laughs> to send us pictures. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. So where can we send those to? We can send them to please send us some pictures. We need them for our uh, photograph segment, so Andy can keep dancing at labrass.tv. That's a really good email address. We should like get a dot .com version of that. Then it would be what? I have to remember all that? Yeah, do it. You have to send us a bunch of pictures so that uh, we have more photographs for our picture segment. And Andy can keep dancing, dot .tv. Nice. I, that was close. Anyways. That was not far off. But then you can get it from hover.com. You can register that. You can get it from that. hover, yes. All right, very good. All right, so don't forget to send your pictures in. Of course, if you want a, a more simple address, remember the email you could use. Feedback at labrats.tv. There you go. We like to keep it easy and simple for you guys out there in Labrats land. All right, anything else from you, Mr. Uh, Carruthers? <sighs> Did you kill any more cats in the last? Did you euthanize any more cats lately? No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess not. All right, well, thank you for tuning in this week and pushing play. It would be foolish for us to be here answering your emails if you weren't out there writing them. My name is Andy Walker. I'm Sean Carruthers. And we'll see you next time. Yojin! Sweet! Dead battery! No! What are we talking about? Yojin! What's Yojin? Sweet!